All right, I think we're going to get started for now. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. Again, if uh, you can hold on mute until we get to the question section, and then by all means, if you want to type in your question or uh, actually speak your question, either of those are great. We will be uh, hitting that probably around the 20 minute mark. Uh, in the meantime, you can throw questions into the group chat. I probably won't get to them until we get to the question section, but feel free to throw them in there um, so that they're there and I can come back to them as we get there. Uh, this will be recorded and what will likely happen is, I don't know that you'll get this recording, but a truncated like here are the, all the important points. Um, here are all the important points moving forward. So hopefully that's useful. Um, and then we'll talk about where you might go for next steps as we get to the end of this. Um, so I'm just going to uh, remind one more time if people want to turn off their mics, uh, at least until the question section. And I am going to get started with the presentation, uh, mostly by first just turning off my video since at least I find me distracting. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Um, so thank you for coming to this workshop or this, this short webinar on designing effective rubrics to foster student success. Uh, and what we're hoping out of this or, you know, what we hope you take from this is just a better sense of the things you can do with rubrics, um, different types of rubrics and the ways that rubrics work, particularly within Latte. Uh, so we'll take a look at a couple of examples. We'll make sure that uh, you get a sense of where things are and talk about how to create them. And then also, obviously, questions at the end. So the first thing in this, this may, you know, is one of those basic questions, but, you know, this idea of what is a rubric. And I really think, uh, you know, a rubric is different things at different times. So before the actual due date, before the actual assignment is being created for the instructor, it's really a matrix of categories and quantitative quantitative value to capture the expectations in an activity in our assignment, right? So this is the idea of you're trying to just kind of give this really good sense, this grid around uh, almost a, if you do this, then, you know, if this, then that. Um, so there, there's an element of algorithmic, you know, thinking here, but really trying to give the student a sense of a pathway. And so that's why you know, for the student, it is a guide to the places of importance for the execution of an assignment or activity. What is it that they really need to do? And what are the values of each of those particular items or those particular points? Um, so those two work hand in hand. It helps the instructor, for, you know, to, to figure out where they want the students to think. And then it also is for the students a, a sense of, oh, these are the things I need to think about. I think afterwards, you know, for both, um, one of the things that I think is important or valuable about a rubric is that it's spatio-visual. And what I mean by that is it's not just a visual guide, but also it is about kind of how close and how far you are from, you know, kind of uh, from hitting the high points. And so I think that's an important part of the rubric, at least when um, we're dealing with, with uh, visual ability, is that you can see, you know, how how far or how close am I to the highest level? Um, but again, it's also that quantitative means of evaluating quality. Uh, and that's a little tricky and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but that, that's a hard thing to navigate because often, or for a variety of assignments, um, it, it is sometimes hard to put a numerical value when we're talking about qualitative, qualitative type work. Um, but, and then for the students, it becomes that feedback mechanism of where did and didn't they hit the mark and how do they understand the mark, um, you know, versus their expectations. So I think again, kind of expanding upon this, you know, before and after the submission, I really think for the, you know, for the instructor, there is, it helps them really think about what are the big points, you know, what are those points of focus that they want to make, they think this assignment is about, because, you know, for many of us, we, we do assignments that we were exposed to or that we think are relevant, but we don't always break those down into their smaller parts, like what are those pieces, and so I feel for me, I see the rubric being an opportunity to really break that down and to, to give a sense of like, well, what are those smaller parts? I think it's also important for faculty because it works with alignment. It really helps faculty to draw lines between what they're doing 
in an assignment and how it breaks down and how that aligns with the weekly or the course objectives, um, as well as the learning content. Like, can you draw a line between what they're reading in a given week and a particular area within a rubric? So there's a really good uh, element of just making sure the rubric holds you as an instructor accountable to what it is you want them to be able to do uh, according to what you've said in the, the course outcomes. For the students, it becomes a creation guide and some faculty are a little challenged by that, a little concerned by that, but it is useful for many of these assignments if these are fields that are new to the student or that they're, they're exploring or may not have had uh, certain types of assignments, having a guide, having something to say, like these are the things you really want to make sure you pay attention to. You know, you, you really want to pay attention to um, X as opposed to Y because Y isn't as relevant. And then of course with that is a, the clarity of expectations, right? So if the students better know what's expected to, of them, and I'm sure many of us have had experiences where, you know, there is a two sentence explanation of what the assignment is. And so you're kind of shooting in the dark. You're kind of like, well, maybe I'm going to get, you know, maybe I'm going to get this and maybe I'm not. Um, so the, the rubric ahead of time certainly gives that, that sense of, oh, here's where the instructor wants me to land. Here's where I'm proving that I'm, you know, capable or, or you know, understand what's going on in the course. Uh, and then after the submission, I think, you know, for, for instructors, it really does allow for, it really does encourage uh, an element of consistency and fairness. Right. So for the instructor, this idea that they have a rubric, they have to stick to, the, they should be sticking to the rubric, uh, really allows to not deviate too much. And, and I can speak to this from my own teaching that sometimes I have certainly gotten hooked on or for lack of a better word, fixated on certain things. Um, probably to the detriment of my students, right? So I, I might get really, really concerned about a comma. And I'll, I'll be honest, this was many years ago. Um, you know, the comma, the, the, the punctuation, and yes, punctuation is important, but how much should that consume of the entire assignment? So it can allow us to really focus on and have consistent grading both across all students as well as across the entire course. Um, and then it's also, you know, there, there's, there's the holistic element in that we can kind of really see the big picture and understand um, the assignment both in and of itself, but in the larger picture. Uh, and by having that rubric, we can kind of see like, where did the student land? You know, if we have these four particular categories, uh, these four, you know, things that we're grading on, well, how did they really stand within all of that? And then how might that help me think about moving forward in terms of revising the assignment, but also in terms of revising the rubric? Am I hitting the right spots? You know, if a student lands at uh, A minus and there's somewhere in my head saying, but really this feels more like it's a B minus, but I didn't design the rubric that way, then maybe I have to rethink about, you know, rethink what it is that I'm, I'm aiming for. How did I miss it? For the student side, of course, um, uh, around this after the submission, it's targeted feedback. It's not just saying, oh, you didn't hit the mark, but here's where you didn't hit the mark. Here's the, the concern. Here's the thing that you're missing. You're missing, you know, a, a consistent style of writing, or maybe you're missing a really good argument, or maybe you're missing uh, certain, you know, uh, expectations around a code that is part of the assignment. And then, of course, you know, the holistic feedback that, that how this all fits within their larger picture. I think it's, it's much easier for a student to kind of look across rubrics and start to see the patterns of what are they missing and what aren't they. You know, I've done this with students where I've sat down with them and, and you know, we've gone over their rubrics and we can see like, oh, every assignment, like you're, you're having a lot of trouble with citations. And so that's cost you across assignments, you know, 5% of your grade. Um, so maybe that's something that really needs working on. So this is kind of why it's useful. It really informs, it really benefits uh, both the instructor and the students in terms of consistently and clearly understanding what's expected and how to execute it. So a couple other thoughts in, in this first half is just, you know, all we're doing is, is talking about and, and giving some context for rubrics and then we're going to jump into a handful of rubrics within Latte that you can, we can look at and I'll discuss kind of what the, the intention is behind it. 
So a couple thoughts is, you know, at the end of the day, they do require front loading. And this is often where it's a little challenging. Like it takes a bit of time to create a rubric, create one that you feel really represents or captures the, the dynamics of an assignment, and then to get that into Latte. And so um, inevitably that's where that's where we see instructors, you know, struggling the most is to come up with one, come up with one that really fits because you ultimately want, there's, there's some rubrics such as around a discussion that you can create one and it works for all assignments or for all discussions. But then there's other assignments where there probably does need to be a more finessed, a more focused uh, rubric for each assignment. Not always, or you might start with a base and, uh, and you know, adjust it according to each assignment, but those are the things that kind of take up at that, that beginning. Uh, the other nice thing about rubrics and that I've seen done a lot now, and because I saw it done really well, have done myself is once I create a rubric, that also gives me something to do peer review with. That is, if I want students to give feedback to one another, they can actually use the rubric. They, they can actually use the rubric and use you know, kind of go back and forth over how both the, you know, giving both qua quantitative and then qualitative feedback to one another. And that can up your game when it comes to peer review, because sometimes I'm sure student faculty have, have experience where the, fee the, the feedback is pretty minimal and the rubric really gives a, a way for students to understand what they should be focusing on and how they should be giving that feedback. It also makes them feel more comfortable with the rubric so that when they are being graded on it from the instructor, you know, it feels a little more, a little more right. Uh, language consideration, I would just, you know, think about that language that you use in the rubric, be, you know, be certain you're not necessarily, while we are evaluating, it can often, I've seen some rubrics that can be very judgmental. Um, and so I would encourage just some, some forethought and exploration around, you know, exactly what it is you're trying to convey to the students and what is, how is it best to convey in a medium for, online where whatever that wording is, the student is going to hear the worst version of it, right? We, we have this experience, certainly when we text and the like, where like, you know, our own vulnerabilities amplify any message that is critical of us around those vulnerabilities. And so students are often concerned about, you know, their grades, about how they do certain things. So I just encourage some, some reflection, you know, another set of eyes, some other means for, for you to assess how that language within that rubric stands. Uh, also, so from here, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna show a couple generic rubrics or rubrics that are used in specific courses, but I would encourage you, you know, you also don't have to reinvent the, don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you go into, start doing a little bit of research um, around what your discipline is or, you know, what kind of course you teach and the types of assignments and rubrics, um, you can find a lot of great resources out there. And so you can already start with something as opposed to starting with kind of that blank matrix. And then finally, I just want to emphasize um, rubrics sometimes get criticized for not being flexible enough across different assignments, uh, in particularly with creative assignments. And I would just say there's, I think rubrics are much more flexible than people often give credit for, especially if we treat them as a feedback mechanism, if we treat them as a, as a means of helping students understand where they can improve their work. Um, there's a lot of great uh, ways of doing that. I've seen a lot of great rubrics. One I'm going to just point to real quick here is from the uh, AACU and the creative thinking value rubric. So the AACU has the like a bunch of really phenomenal uh, a bunch of really phenomenal rubrics around different categories and this is their one around creative thinking and I just like it because it does you know, does capture a lot of the important things around creative thinking and, you know, gives us a sense of how they might evaluate those, right? So we have everything from taking risks, which I think, you know, is something we often think about around being creative, solving problems, embracing contradictions, innovative thinking. So I show this mostly as a, for those who are concerned or don't think uh, rubrics work or or feel like they can't use it in a way that they feel it might stifle students' work. I think there's lots of ways they can be used uh, to encourage and to help students grow in terms of their work. All right, so we're gonna take a look at a couple types of rubrics. So just give me a second to pull this up. There we go. 
Um, so one of the things that instructors don't always realize is that you can attach a rubric to an assignment, right? So if I'm in discussion or if I'm grading the discussions for a week, I can actually go in and you wouldn't necessarily see this here, but over on the right, if this was a weekly discussion, I can actually create a clickable rubric right here on the right. So I don't have to add up individual scores. All I have to do is click on this little crossbar here and then here's my rubric, you know, the initial post application, here are my categories, right? So we kind of go from, you know, best to missing. Um, and then, you know, what were the technical criteria, right? So it was, you know, was it, was it grammatically clear? Did it include proper links? What was the, you know, replies? Did they actually provide meaningful replies? So I can actually just click through. Um, and with each of these, if I want, I can give more specific feedback. So I can say, you know, didn't include research, something like that. Um, and then I can come down, I can click here, you know, make sure I check all the boxes. And then once I close that, what's been done now is that score, sorry, scrolling around a bit, um, that score is now captured. So I don't have to actually add up these categories. Uh, and so I can just put in some general feedback here, you know, really good job, da 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 da. And then I just hit, I just hit save changes. And now the student has been graded. Um, and then I can go on to the next. And so it tells me, you know, it added all of that up. The student got a 97.5. Um, but that's this idea of assigned rubrics or, or embedded rubrics is really useful. So um, this is just the discussion rubric, but I want to move over to um, another rubric that I find is really useful, especially for smaller assignments or just as even check-ins. And this is often, or this is what I call a simplified rubric and where it works sometimes really well I've seen is particularly in programming courses where you want students to like they're just doing a very simple um, you know they're they're putting forward a program you're not necessarily getting into the weeds of the program or uh, some some level of code and so you know you have a very simple three-step you know is it uh, program correctness you know present uh, documentation present uh, assignment specifications, did they do all at present? Uh, I made a mistake here, these should all be zero points. So it would be either really pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail. So really simple, you know, you can have these really simple rubrics that just are, again, as the instructor, you can move through pretty quickly and get that feedback to the students pretty quickly. And then again, you just do save and show next and it would bring you to the next assignment, which isn't there. Uh, another example that I also think is really useful is uh, or not so much useful, but again, for that like basic, you're, you're doing a smaller assignment, you're doing something that students are mostly just kind of going, they're more, they're wanting some feedback, but it's not a huge assignment. It's, it's an iterative assignment or it's almost a, a check-in, like I need some feedback. And this is uh, what people often call a holistic rubric where there's really only one column or the, sorry, there's only one um, one criteria, and that it, that is ultimately the grade, and you just choose the box that makes sense. Okay, so you know the student had some really good stuff, but wasn't quite perfect, so they get a 90. And then of course you follow it up here with a bit more detail about why that 90 exists, and then you just then close it and uh, again you submit it. But, uh, yeah. Oh, right here, sorry. Um, so you can kind of move through move through each. Um, again, fairly quickly, and again, providing more, some specific feedback to, uh, to students. But I wanna move into another example right now, which is when you have bigger assignments and you're really working on trying to give some good critical feedback. So this might be something you use for, uh, say, an essay or some larger project. This is one I've often used for assignments I do around, uh, well, around essays actually in, in the courses that I teach. And so one criteria is focus and that should say details, not detail. Um, and I would select, you know, 
which area this fills, you know, which area this makes most sense. The paper has a clear and sustained focus. The details are clear, accurate, and relevant to the points being made. Um, so I might select that, then I might move to application, right? And so in this case, it's often, are they actually using um, both a mixture of, of critical thought and some unique and new ideas not necessarily presented in the course already? So are they able to transfer this is really what this question is about. Style, they're using college level language that's varied, appropriate, and accurate. Uh, they're not using an abundance of, of crazy adjectives and, and the like. Organization, does, you know, does it have flow? Does it have useful transitions, all of that? And then mechanics, maybe there's some grammatical and mechanical errors though. So again, I can click that and then boom, I'm ready to give more feedback and move on. And that's something that, you know, to really think about, this is where you really wanna focus your uh, attention on developing those rubrics to, to really capture that, those assignments uh, that are gonna be large value to the students. Uh, but I, so there's that, and that's a rubric. And then Latte also has what's called a, a uh, grading guide. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but in all of these other, all of these rubrics thus far, you have a set grade, right? So if I want to choose this, then in focus and detail, they can only get 32, 30, 25, 17. But in the grading guide, what's really nice is that I can do a range for each one. So what this looks like is in focus and detail, um, it's totally worth 35%, but I can choose up to that range and I can have this information here to indicate why I might choose a particular range. So I might very quickly, you know, copy and paste this into to here because that's the feedback I want students to get and give that student, you know, a 27. Um, again, I can come into here and maybe I decide they did really well. So I'll use this first one, put it in and do 35. Now, if you notice, I'm copying pasting a lot, which again, would probably be a little more um, challenging early on. But one of the things that Latte also does is when you use this feature, you can also start to create comments. Right, so here again, we are in the grade area. Here's focus and detail. This is a different assignment. And I've created a bunch of uh, frequently used comments. And so, oh, this is the one that I want, or this is the one that I want. Boom, it pops it right into there and I can just give the appropriate score. You know, they got a 35. Uh, so as you can see, there's a wide range of ways to play around with the rubrics, to provide information, to reduce some of the time in providing that numerical score so that you can really focus on the quali qualitative you know, feedback uh, and even preload some of that qualitative feedback in there. So that was types of rubrics uh, there. I think I ran about three minutes over, but I'd love to hear questions from people at this point. So you can either uh, throw them in the chat or you can just speak up and share your questions. Hi Lance, it's Steve. Hey Steve. Um, these clickable, the clickable area within the grading yep. section, that I don't recall that being a feature when Brian did his three session course on Ruby some time ago. Is that new to Latte since then? Um, my guess is I'm not sure when Brian did that, but I do know this is something probably in the last two or so years. And it's been something we've been, as we've been working with fac newer faculty, been trying to make sure to implement. It is our rubrics going to be something more stressed going forward with at least within RAB school? Uh, I, I would say we're, we're certainly trying to emphasize them. I think it, it ends up, again, it's what in the design process, we nowadays, we do incorporate them in the design process, whereas where instructors do need to create the rubrics. Um, and then we, as we're designing the course, put them into the assignments. So I would say yes, as, as courses are get being redesigned and also initially designed, they are uh, being incorporated. One of, one of the things that um, I find about rubrics is it, some, it sometimes ties my hand. And I, and I like that range feature you showed us towards the end. Mm -hmm. I tend to be more lenient in the first 
week or two, especially around um, discussion questions. And certainly at the end, when, at the end of a term, when things are very busy and lots of assignments to do and things are crazy. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that won't tie my, that at least the range feature will untie my hand some. Yeah, so if you use the, the grading guide, which is just a different form of, of a rubric, uh, I think it does give you a bit more range and that's certainly helpful, uh, especially, you know, I think that's really helpful when it comes to students that are repeating the same mistakes and you're, you're trying to find a way of communicating like, no, you really do need citations for, you know, this or no, you really do need to include your documentation for your code and the like. So I definitely think that's uh, useful. I do see, uh, can there be a mix of pre-selected grades and enterable ones? Um, not quite sure what you mean by that, but let me give, uh, let me jump to your second question and we can come back to that. Is there any initiative to have all weekly participation rubrics standards across RAB? Um, no, and the reason for that is one of the things we're pushing for is to really encourage you know instructors to think about what weekly participation looks like we want we want instructors to have a bit more flexibility discussions are you know the lifeblood of, of many online courses but we also are encouraging and wanting faculty to think about well what other way does weekly participation or interaction among students and the instructor what can that look like um, so that's something we're we're hesitant to create kind of a uh, a standard at this point because we're really looking for for faculty to uh, kind of you know break outside of that box of discussions or we're looking for some good examples or wanting to encourage faculty to move uh, to try other ways of, of engagement. Uh, sure, that would be great for the audio explanation. Can you hear me, Lance? Yes. Okay, good. So toward the end there, you were showing how there was a range that I could select and then I could enter in a specific grade within that range. Prior to that, those were already pre-selected for me. So I just selected it and it gave 10 points, five points or what have you. Yep. Is there, is there a way that I can set up a rubric that has both? So I can select one that already has a predefined number associated with it. And then just like there is a, an enterable box over to the far right, can I have prior to that box something that I can enter in and arrange with the description? Uh let me make sure I'm, uh, I'm understanding correctly. So the idea would be there are some areas that it's almost like a yes or no, or, or like it's, a, it's much easier to, to just choose a point value, whereas others you would need more of a range? Exactly. Okay. Unfortunately, no. Um, Latte, it's kind of either the, the grading guide, um, which you have you end up having to put in manually the, the point value or it's the clickable. Uh, we are getting an updated version of Latte. I don't know if that will have any changes in it regarding these two features, um, but at this point to my knowledge, I'm not aware of that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Other questions that people have, again, you can either speak up or use the, the chat box where the uh, range you're showing us now might mm -hmm. be useful um, in my uh, first couple of weeks and the last couple of weeks because what I could do there is say um, you didn't quite do everything but because it's the start of the semester and people are trying to find their way mm -hmm. know, in class I'm giving you full credit yep yeah and, and that's you know you can and what I like is you know you if you in the initial programming, treat it like a rubric and you provide some ranges uh, as I have here, then they're knowing like, okay, if I get 30, you know, if I get 32%, I'm in the excellent range, but there may be some things that I need to adjust moving forward based on the, the feedback. Cool. Well, um, I do want to just make sure, let's see. I do want to just briefly talk about next steps, which is I would encourage you to, you know, if you get a chance, go and play with rubrics, uh, both inside the course and, and outside. 
Um, we're going to be following this up with a week-long training with Enlatte where you can join us, you can submit something for feedback around uh, a rubric you want to develop or you want to tweak or you want feed, you know, you want to design for uh, one of the assignments in your course. And then of course we will be continuing to run a variety of workshops and webinars throughout 2020. Uh, so we hope to also see you there. Uh, in the meantime, you know, Good luck with your with the end of your semester and good luck, you know, have a wonderful break, whatever that entails. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.